So today I would like to uh, to uh, start talking about recurrent neural networks, and just let's remind ourselves what we had in fully connected perceptrons. So in fully connected perceptrons, I will I will just uh, show you one layer. Let's ignore for a second that uh, our uh, we actually have vector valued inputs and vector valued outputs but let's say that our input is just is just uh, basically i have just one one feature map so i have these uh, these coordinates xm going through a linear combination with the weights w and m right of course the sum is over n i'm ignoring the bias term and this gives me the output sample n Okay, so the exact form is not very important. What I would like to, uh, what I would like you to pay attention is that the input and the output are necessarily of the same fixed dimension. Of course, the input dimension might be different from the output dimension, but we cannot change the input dimension. We cannot change the output dimension unless we want to retrain the weights again. Okay, so it will be a different architecture if we change the dimensions of the input and the output. Okay. Now, what we had with convolutional networks was slightly better. So we, we thought of X as some infinite signal, and Y some infinite signal. Again, I'm ignoring the fact that these signals could be vector valued. Uh, so with, with convolutional layers, we may produce outputs of varying dimension for inputs of varying dimension. Let's say we don't do any pooling, any decimation. So then for the same size of the input, we get exactly the same size of the output. If we do pooling, then there will be some ratio relating the input dimension and the output dimension, this ratio will be fixed, okay? What is, what is unnice is that the output of Yn uh, depends only on some small number of input uh, samples. In, for example, it doesn't depend on the inputs from minus infinity to, uh, to n minus capital M, which is the size of what is called the receptive field of this convolutional layer, okay? Uh, so, um, if I want to add some sort of persistence, if I want, for example, my uh, my model to to be able to uh, adapt to very long-term context, for example, of my information, and I will show you some examples, for example, in in language processing, then I I probably need some 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 different tool, and I will I will actually. Uh, I will contradict myself. I will show you that, that there are actually very interesting uh, architectures existing today, which are perfectly feed-forward, like uh, time-dilated convolutional neural networks, which uh, uh, also feature this uh, this idea of persistence. But one of the standard ways of introducing persistence is by using recursion. Okay, so if we use recursion, we end up with what is called recurrent neural networks, and a recurrent neural network is nothing but a nonlinear dynamic system. Okay, so in a dynamic system, what we have is an input. I will be thinking now of all my inputs and outputs and states as time sequences. Okay, so I have an input and n-dimensional time sequence, xt. I will will be using green to indicate x, and because our projector is color blind or partially color blind, forgive me if I refer to colors in an appropriate way. I, I will have some hidden state ht, which is unobservable or at least not directly observable. And uh, I will have some initial state. Of course, I need to initialize this system. So the initial state will be some H0. It can be learned, it can be fixed. Let's say uh, that probably 90% 90, 90 of the cases it is not learned by just fixed to zero. And then I have a state update equation that will take the state from the previous step, take the input at the current step, and produce me the, uh, the state of the current step that will be used in the next mm -hmm. step, okay? I didn't understand myself what I said, but hopefully you follow. Okay, so what is what is important is that the next state is, com is calculated from the previous state and the current input by a function which I'm denoting here by f theta. So it's a parametric function. Theta are tunable parameters, learnable parameters, and this function is fixed in time, okay? So it doesn't depend on t, which is important. Okay, so it, it is a typical assumption for a dynamic system that that it can produce very rich uh, input-output maps, but the map itself, this uh, state update equation, is fixed in time. And the output will be computed from our updated sta uh, state ht by another function g theta. We I will just for simplicity assume that it depends on the same parameters theta. Of course, we 
this is the most general setting, right? So some some coordinates in this vector theta can be uh, reserved for f, some other coordinates can be reserved for g. Okay, I just don't want to mess up with the two sets of parameters. G is again a fixed function. Okay, so basically we have a, f a state machine in discrete time. This is how it looks like. It receives the input. Here we have the f and the g, right? Uh, it uh, re f receives the input in the previous state spits out the next uh, state. And I'm putting a delay here, it's delayed by one time unit, because basically this state will be only available after, uh, basically on the, the next clock, if you will. And then from this HT, by, by means of G, I'm computing the output. Okay, so this is, uh, this is how a, a recurrent neural network looks like. Uh, and I can also think of it as a feed-forward network. I can just unroll it in time. Okay, so let's start with some H0. I'm, I'm feeding my network with an input x1. It produces the state h1 and output y1. Then I feed it with x1, x2. So I can replicate, the, but, but basically in drawing, I can replicate, let's call this f. Okay? It receives exactly the same parameters theta. Okay? It's exactly the same parameters. It's, it's fixed in time. Okay? Uh, so this f now receives the next state, produces the following state, h2, and uh, spits out the output y2, okay, and so on. So basically this infinite sequence is, a, is a, an unrolled representation of this dynamical system, okay? And actually it is a very, it is a very convenient uh, way of thinking about, R, uh, about RNNs, because uh, then, for example, if we ask ourselves how to compute the gradients, if you think of it this way, the answer is simple by doing back propagation, right? Just back propagation in time through this unfolded, unrolled architecture. Okay? So theta are the weights, and f is a collective representation of the, this nonlinear transformation. So here, the only time, time, varying, uh, time varying quantity is this state and the input, of course. The transformation itself is not. Well, you can. So, can you can you make an architecture that has different time, basically that has some time varying uh, time varying properties? Of course, for example, when we talk about attention, you can think of it uh, collectively. This box will be doing a different function at every at every step because the attention vector will be will be calculated differently. But then you again can decompose it into something that that has another state that changes in time and some function that is uh, is time invariant. Okay. So let's have a look at a, at a vanilla RNN, a very simple uh, embodiment of an RNN. We have a, um, a state update, it's an, a non-linear fully connected layer, so we have just a linear transformations followed by a non-linearity, point-wise non-linearity like the sigmoid function or hyperbolic tangent. So the the what, what we have inside are uh, three parameters. So WHH is a matrix that maps from uh, HT minus 1 to HT. Okay, WXH, which maps from XT to HT. And B is a bias term. So, of course, the dimensions have to be, to be set accordingly. Okay, Output is just a linear fully connected layer. We are just multiplying HT by a matrix WHY. Of course, dimensions on the second index is the dimension of H. On the first index is the dimension of Y. Okay, and basically, this is what I call theta. It's actually a collective representation of all these parameters. Okay, so just check the dimension. This should be correct. WHH is obviously K by K uh, square matrix, because K is the dimension of the state. Uh, Wxy is a k by n matrix, so it takes an input of the size n and produces a state of the size k. Hy, it's, uh, it takes the state of size k and produces output of dimension m, and b is a bias term with the dimension of, of the state k. Okay? So let me show you some typical uses of RNNs, and uh, uh, hopefully this will also emphasize the strength of, the, of using recurrence. So that one, of the, one of the ways is, is called many to one. So many refers to inputs, and one refers to, to the outputs. 
so for example, I'm uh, feeding the network with the time sequence that contains words in some representation. You will see, you will see in the tutorial how words can be represented as vectors, what is called vector embedding. But let's say I have the phrase that tells, I really hate this hotel, end of phrase. Okay, so this is my sequence of six uh, inputs. Okay, so I'm crunching the state, I'm updating the state, and then I ignore the outputs that I, that I produced uh, until I got to this end literal, and then I do the output and it gives me, let's say, some class distribution which tells me that the guy is upset. Okay? So, for example, the, this, is, this can be used in, in sentiment analysis. I would like to analyze the general mood of the person uh, writing this text. Okay? Arguably, it's an important application. Let's see another application. Let's say one to many. So one to, uh, one to many, uh, as the input, I have one object. For example, it can be an image. Well, typically, this will not be an image. It will be some embedding of an image using, for example, a CNN. So I crunch the pixels of the, of the image with a CNN. I produce some embedding vector, some fixed dimensional vector. And then I feed it to the first, uh, uh, basically, to the first uh, as the first input to the network. Then I'm feeding no, no inputs, and I'm just crunching this, the state. And every output that I'm producing, for example, uh, the, the output here, here will be huge aerial terrier dog, end of phrase. Okay, so for example, if I want to, to write captioning or to annotate uh, an image, this is a very, this is a very uh, efficient architecture. So I start with some image embedding, and I produce a phrase. And in the, fra in the phrase, I don't know ahead of time how many uh, uh, output dimensions I'm going to have. So basically I have variable length output, and before I had variable length input. Now I can combine these two, uh, these two approaches into, into basically one big network. So I, I might have basically one network with the parameters, let's say theta, and another network with the parameters theta prime. So the first part will be a uh, a many to one, another one will be a one to many. The first will be called an encoder, another one, the second one will be called a decoder. We'll speak about this kind of encoder decoder architecture more when we, we talk about generative models. But for example, think of language translation. So in language translation, I have some variable length input, a phrase in one language, and then I have a variable length output, a phrase in another language, which do not necessarily coincide in the number of, of dimensions, right? So, for example, I have this trivial phrase, the cat ate a mouse, end of phrase, in the, in the input. Let's say I'm translating to Italian, and I write il gatto ha mangiato un topo, end of phrase. Okay, so we have a different number of words here, and let's elaborate on this a little bit. Uh, I have this noun, right, the subject, a verb, and an, and an object. Okay, so I can translate, of course, the subject, clearly, the cat becomes il gatto. Now, the verb becomes two words, okay? Think of it something like, like, like uh, present perfect in English, but with a different grammatical sense. And here we have, again, un topo is, is, the, is the object. Again, two words because of the use of the, of the articles. Uh, well, here it's just, we just need to do a, a, to do a, a, a variable length input to variable length output map, it's quite straightforward. But let's say we're translating to German. In German, the verb actually splits into two parts and it has to enclose the subject. Okay, like, like, like the cat has a mouse eaten, something like that. Uh, and basically, to, to be, actually to open this bracket and close this bracket, we need some persistence, some, some notion of a context, right? Very, very short-term context here, of course, because we just need to keep it for for the length of two words, two outputs. But still, this is a context that it is arguably difficult to do, to do with 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 the tools we know so far. Okay, let's say we translate to Russian. So in Russian, koshka siela mish. There are no articles in in this phrase. So if we are translating from English to Russian, it's perfectly fine. But now, we are, when we are translating from Russian to English, the translation is ambiguous. This can translate to anything like the cat ate the mouse, or a cat ate a mouse, or uh, M a ca cat ate the mouse. And actually, the one of the selections will be correct, and we only know, we know it from a longer-term context of the entire paragraph, or the entire text that we are translating, whether it's this specific cat or just any cat, right? 
we don't know it from the phrase itself, so we need some bigger context. And this is, w this is what RNNs are uh, particularly strong at. Now, we can add some more to this. So I can actually take my vanilla RNN here. OK, so this is basically, this is my, my RNN. And feed it out with, as the input of another RNN. OK, so it will have different parameters, a different, different state. And of course, I can build on top of it a few more layers. So you can now unfold this in time. So this horizontal direction will be time. And this vertical direction will be depth. So nothing prevents me uh, from adding depth to RNN models, and this is practiced quite uh, quite often. Okay. Now you can. You, so you you probably are thinking of RNNs something that necessarily takes time sequences as the input, like in, like in the language example. Of course, this is a, a very strong field of application, but I can actually take something that doesn't have a uh, total order relation, so to say, something that is not necessarily naturally represented as sequential. Uh, data and make it a sequential data. For example, here I'm showing you two examples from two different papers. Uh, one of them is using uh, sequential processing for classification. So I'm moving a window. Okay, I'm moving a window. Uh, so this this is called the tension mechanism. I will show it to you next week. Uh, and I'm gradually building my confidence in a certain class. So I'm looking, uh, looking at my data through this window. I'm deciding where to look at uh, based on my previous observations. And I'm deciding which class is that. Okay? So this is the left example. And an image is not a sequential data, by, but my observations of, these, uh, of this image are sequential. Okay? And this is actually how our eyes uh, analyze an image. We can track the mo motion of the eyes and, and see that basically we are actually scanning the, the picture. Yes? The CNN and the RNN. So let's say, let's let's remove nonlinearity from the neural network. So let's just think of uh, of a convolutional uh, uh, convolutional layer and a, a linear dynamical system. So then the difference would be more or less like between a finite impulse response filter and an infinite fi impulse response filter, right? So basically, this is this is the difference. Finite impulse response filter is very straightforward. It has a fixed number of parameters. It has a fixed and known um, uh, um, receptive field in, in the sense that how many inputs or which inputs affect the specific output. And in, infinite impulse response is a mess. Uh, it can be unstable, for example. We can make it unstable by, by wrong selection of parameters. It can have very long tail in this impulse response, so it can be sensitive to very uh, distant inputs in the past if I'm thinking of it as a, as a, as a temporal filter. Uh, and it is much more, much more difficult to analyze and to design. Okay, so uh, now think what happens when you, do, when you add nonlinearity. So it, it was already difficult to do anything uh, uh, significant in terms of analysis uh, to, an, uh, to an IAR filter. Now imagine a nonlinear dynamical system. It's very complex. Uh, and I will argue I'm not a big fan of RNNs. They are doing spectacular work, but I think today there are better alternatives in terms of feedforward architectures. So you can get this very long-term uh, context by by doing dilated convolutions, and I will show it to you after after I show you some basic RNN stuff. Okay. Yes, yes I, I totally agree with you. And basically, there are spectacular works that show language translation and uh, also, for example, speech synthesis using uh, completely feed, basically end-to-end feed-forward models. So I, I agree. I absolutely agree. So maybe, maybe 10 years ago or five years ago even, it, would, it was uh, almost necessary, almost imperative to use uh, uh, RNNs for these applications. I think today the, uh, this is questionable. OK? Any other questions? OK, so just the example on the right-hand side is, again, classification, or so, sorry, it's generation. So imagine, again, an image is not a sequential type of data, but uh, how would a painter paint a picture? There is some sequence of strokes that will be applied to, to a canvas, right? So you can reproduce it by, 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 uh, by RNN. So this sequence of strokes will be sequential data. So then you basically you paint your, your image in a generative model. And if we are talking about generative models, 
RNNs are very strong at, at, at generation, and we'll talk about generative models uh, in the sequel. But let's imagine that we have an RNN that produces one character at a time. Okay, so one character, one character of language. Uh, let's say ASCII characters. So Im let's think what this thing can do. We are just producing one character from, uh, and we are building a generative model. And it appears it can do a lot. For example, RNN trained on uh, on a full corpus of Shakespeare's work can generate something like this. Okay, so uh, first of all, uh, there are no spelling mistakes almost. The the sentences, at least if you at, at least at some brief glance, they look grammatically compelling. Also, the arrangement of the text looks like Shakespeare's play, also with characters uh, highlighted. Uh, of course, if you try start reading, this looks like nonsense, but you find even, you know, like things like this, uh, typical Shakespeare's abbreviations and uh, uh, and basically many, many, uh, many so usage of vocabulary, of course, uh, uh, grammatical forms that are typical for the, for, for the English language of that time. Uh, and it's quite remarkable that this is a single character level generative model. Okay, now you can generate uh, computer languages, like for example, LaTeX. LaTeX is a typesetting language, and uh, this was trained. Oh, unfortunately, you don't see it well. We'll see it well in video. So LaTeX uh, is a typesetting language. Uh, uh, this generative model was trained in, on an open source uh, LaTeX source of uh, of a book. A textbook on algebraic topology, and you can see it actually generates something that looks like a mathematical book. So, of course, if you read the sentences, it's nonsense. It required quite, quite, uh, quite a little bit of correction to make it compile. It still has broken, uh, broken references, like you see these uh, lemmas that uh, have no no references. But you see, it it also learned to omit proofs, like probably was uh, done mu multiple times in the original book, like proof omitted. Uh, and it actually, you know, in cat category theory and algebraic topology, these kind of diagrams appear all the time. So it learned to generate nonsensical diagrams with arrows and, and, uh, and characters, but it's, it's quite amazing. And this is an RNN trained on, uh, on the corpus of the Linux kernel uh, code. So it generates viable C code with, that would compile, probably it will do garbage. Uh, but you see it also puts comments that make sense. And there are, there are many more interesting examples. Uh, of course, it sometimes returns um, uh, undefined variables or sometimes uses no input variables, but still it looks like a C code. Also, also the format is, uh, is quite nicely maintained. So it's quite, quite an interesting and unexpected power of, uh, of recurrent uh, neural networks. So let's see how we, how we train RNNs. Uh, so remember that this is a dynamical, uh, dynamical system. It has outputs every uh, time unit. We have discrete time. So we can define this loss that will be the sum of losses at time t. So I will write LT, y, y t. For, so we'll see, for example, for language models, there are different uh, losses that we can define in this form. And uh, if we compute the gradient of this loss, so basically we want, remember we want delta theta, the derivative of this big loss with respect to the parameters theta of the model. Of course, remember that this y t is a function of theta, right? This is where the, the dependence on the parameters comes to. So this will be the sum from t from one, uh, till going from zero to capital T of these individual temporal losses, uh, lowercase lt, that are functions of the uh, temporal outputs yt, which are in turn functions of theta, okay? So this y is a function of theta, obviously. Okay. So let's just remind ourselves how y and h are obtained. So y theta is a function that depends on theta of h t. Okay. And h t, in its turn, is a is a function f of theta of h t minus one and x t. Okay. So x t is just constant. Okay. It's just an input. Uh, so there is a dependence on theta here, dependence on theta here, and of course this is also a function of theta. Okay, 
Question, please. Well, I mean, so uh, is there any significance to time intervals? So to me, time is just discrete. So it's like going from time time t to times t plus one. There is no meaning to uh, to this interval one, any specific meaning. It's just discrete time. It's just a convenient uh, representation. Okay. Any other questions? Yes. How is the loss defined, and to where to what I compare the yt? It, it is it de it depends on the application, of course. So I, I can, for example, do some time series regression. Let's say I want to predict uh, some uh, financial instrument valuation. Let's say some stock price. Okay. So I might have historical data. I know the stock price. It's a time. It's a time series, and I my predictor in the form of RNN produces a number. I have a different number. I compare them. Let's say in, in some using let's say the squared loss, and this is how LT is defined. But of course, there are many other possibilities. Okay. Yes. Sometimes the data set has a number of sequences, but you treat it here just single sequence. I mean, if you're trying to uh, translate documents, so every document is, in a sense, a sequence. So how do you combine all those sequences into one large sequence? Okay, so 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 uh, what what you are probably referring to is uh, is that this sum might be we I might need to break it. For, uh, uh, into subsums where the state of the network is being reset. So I can do this at the level of a mini batch, for example. If I have, for example, a document containing multiple phrases, I would like the context to remain intact within the same document, but I don't want to carry this context over to a different document. So I can do this at the level of a mini batch if it makes sense. If it doesn't make sense, I can write a sum of several sums in the loss and basically reset the state in between. But let's assume that basically all this sum is done with, uh, with the same initial state. So I'm initializing the state, let's say H, some h0, either learned or fixed at t equals zero, and then I carry on my state from that point forward in time. Okay? Any, any other questions? Okay, so, so let's, see, let's see what we do with this term. So again, this term is the gradient of one uh, specific temporal value of the loss for one specific output of the network at time t. Okay. So let's just apply the chain rule, of course. What else can we apply? Uh, so the chain rule will tell, uh, tell us this. And again, I'm using, of course, the Jacobians here are actually tensors. So, so I'm writing them as if they were matrices. Uh, and I defined it rigorously uh, uh, last time when we talked about uh, the chain rule, when we talked about uh, feed-forward networks, how exactly it is defined. Okay, but we, it's sort of straightforward. Uh, so what we have here is the derivative of the loss with respect to its input, which is y t, which is the output of the network. Then we take the derivative of now y. Remember, y is g of h t. And there are two dependencies here. So it's first of all the g itself depends on theta, and then h, its argument depends on theta. So I will write a sum. First, it will be the derivative of g at point h t with respect to theta. Okay. So it's the gradient of the uh, of the function g with respect to the parameter theta. And then I will have the derivative of h uh, with respect to theta, which I can write as the derivative of g with respect to h times the derivative of h t with respect to theta. Okay? So basically what we have here is the derivative of, of y as if h t was a constant, as if it didn't depend on, uh, on theta, as if it, basically its input were a constant. So I will, write it, I will write it like this. I will write this notation uh, partial plus. It's the, in the immediate derivative ignoring the dependence of the input on theta. And the, I think this is a convenient uh, syntax that I'm stealing from Benjo's, Benjo's papers. I think it's, it's, very, it's very useful. Okay, so again, this plus means that I, uh, I, uh, there is an input depending on my parameter, and I'm thinking of it as if it were a constant. Okay? So in, in this specific embodiment, this is just the derivative of, of g with respect to the parameters. Okay? And then I have this. Uh, then I have this term. Okay. So let's now see what this derivative amounts to. 
So it's the derivative of h t with respect to theta. Okay, so it will be again the derivative of f with respect to theta. So f depends on theta, and h t minus one is also a function of theta. So I have two terms. So one is the derivative of f theta with respect to theta. Then uh, there will be derivative of f with respect to dht minus 1 to its first argument. And the derivative of this first argument, ht minus 1, with, uh, with respect to the parameter theta. And again, I can write this as this kind of instantaneous derivative. Okay? d plus ht over theta, which means that uh, I'm ignoring the fact that ht minus 1 on which it depends is a parameter of theta. And I'm adding this dependence here in this second term. Okay. So let's just do some algebraic massage to this to this expression. So I can, of course, I can substitute what I computed before here, and I can do it again. See, and I can continue until I get to t equals zero, right? So if I do this, let's just see what is written here. So let's just apply the chain rule backwards. What what is written here? So let's say I do this calculation from h t d h t over t minus one. Then I, here we have d h t minus one over d h t minus two until I get to some i. Okay. So this is the chain rule for d h t over d h i. Okay. So I can write it like this. Okay. I will have a sum i ri running from one to t. I will have this part because of the dependence of g on theta. I will have this part because of the dependence on f on theta. And here I will have these derivatives of h t over h i. Okay, the, I just collapsed what is written here into a single into a single derivative. Okay. So if you followed me, then basically we can write the total expression. It will be remember this was just one one element in this sum. Okay, so I'm keeping this sum t goes from zero to t to capital T, and I'm substituting what we computed here, okay? So it's again another sum over uh, over these ugly ugly expressions here. Well, not, not so ugly, but still. So what, I'm, what I can write here, the, I can think of these as temporal contributions measuring how the parameters theta at time i affect the loss at time t bigger than i, okay? And specifically the role of this partial derivative of this Jacobian of h t over h i. Actually, this Jacobian, I'm, remember, I'm multiplying it by it multiple times. This, uh, this Jacobian transports, uh, uh, transports information back in time from t to i, from step t to, to step i. Okay? I'm, uh, I'm summing these contributions. Yes? This is just for one layer. Layer? It's just one layer. I'm, I, it's, it, there are no layers. I, I mean, by layer, usually in RNNs, by layer you mean that the output of an RNN feeds the input of another RNN. Sure, true, true. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Fortunately, you have good tools for automatic differentiation like Firetouch. <laughs> yeah. Sure, sure. But I think for instance, time, it's extremely, it's extremely simple, right? Every, basically, for every time step you are doing Quite a simple calculation. Just let's say two fully connected la two fully connected layers, one for the state, another one for the output. And if you have multiple layers, then multiply it by the depth. And you, do, you won't, won't see many tens of layers there. See just a few maybe. Okay. Any other questions? Yes. I think in this application, the time sequence application, uh, what really matters is uh, just uh, not, not all the past of the uh, network. Just just five or six steps uh, I, I, I disagree. So uh, we are building this thing exactly to have very long long term context. Uh, so basically, so by long term, I mean so long term. Let's say short term means that i is approximately equal to t, and long term means that i is significantly farther in time than t. So, for example, in the automatic translation example. Like they, they would like translating, let's say, uh, uh, the cat ate a mouse from Russian. You might need an entire page of text to understand whether you're talking about this, this, the cat, or just any cat. 
you, you cannot infer it from the phrase itself, and you may maybe need to go backwards many phrases in time to uh, to get this idea, right? So maybe it's not such a huge uh, such a huge deal because because every word is uh, I don't know it's just one t temporal step. How many words can you go backwards? Maybe a thousand words. It is still challenging to do it with convolutional neural networks. Uh, the way we define them, okay? So I will show you that you can do uh, you can do dilated convolutions, and then you can really get exponential ex exponentially big uh, receptive field uh, as a function of the depth. So with let's say just twenty or thirty layers, you can get thousands of samples backwards. Okay? Yes. Okay. Okay. So so I, we haven't talked about the about vanishing gradients yet. I guess we'll, we have to. To defer it to uh, uh, to next week because basically it's uh, I, I will need some basically to to prepare some setting okay so but essentially what happens here is that remember in our definition of the vanilla RNN we had uh, we had those matrices W that uh, will appear here as the gradients right or there there are joints there are transposes will appear as the gradients so. If we just take this matrix and multiply it by itself multiple times, because the functions, basically, this term and this term, they don't depend, depend on time. We have these products of, uh, of matrices that if we have uh, an eigenvalue bigger than one, we might have directions in which the noise will be amplified very significantly. And, and if we have eigenvalues smaller than one, they will vanish by taking a, a big power of the matrix. And this is called vanishing and exploding, exploding gradients. So we, we'll, see, we'll, we'll do this analysis slightly, slightly more in detail uh, next week. Uh, and we'll see, we'll see measures how to prevent, uh, at least how to practically prevent, uh, this explosion or, or, vanishing, uh, or vanishing of the gradients. Okay, and this is, for example, why we are going to use the gating mechanism, like in LSTM networks. Okay, so hope so. This is just a teaser. I hope uh, the answer will answer your question. Okay. Any other questions? Yes. Yes. If we go back to the, <coughs> to the stocks example, mm -hmm. uh, I, in that example, I'm interested in knowing the, the why the stock price not today but in the next year or something. If you want to invest in the stock. Oh, oh, so of course. So in the stock in the stock market example, of course, what you care about is not. It's not regression, but but prediction, right? But you still train the network on historical data. So let's say I I gave you. So let's say I have historical data from 2000 to 2018. I show you the value of the stock in 2000 and give me the values in 2001. Of course, I'm exaggerating because it's very difficult to do for stock, but maybe some other financial instrument that would make more sense. Uh, uh, so in that case, of course, I ha I know the ground truth. I know what was the the actual price. But I'm asking you to predict, right? And then I can compare to the to the to the actual price. So it is still valid. It just just matters uh, in this in that definition of LT how far you are going to go in in the future, which on historical data is already in the past. Okay. Any other questions? Yes. Yeah, a question from earlier. It feels like you can actually benefit from taking the time uh, into consideration about syntax, like translating a book. If the context is way in the back, you maybe you should treat it as less significant or less important than something that happens within the current paragraph. So, so what, what you're suggesting is, at least in, 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 the, in the NLP, in the natural language processing domain, that you want to treat differently, or maybe with a decreasing importance, the long-term context. If the application requires it, you have the mechanism to for the mechanism to forget long-term context, right? If but you have the mechanism to remember it, and if if needed, you can you can just ignore it. Uh, I, what I'm saying that at least a vanilla CNN cannot remember long-term context because it d doesn't have that uh, that wide a uh, receptive field. Okay, so here at least you have uh, a theoretical possibility to remember everything that happened in the past. And decide to do whatever you want with it, whether you want to forget it or not. It's it's your choice, or basically the way you're going to uh, to find the parameters that solve some 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 specific problem, right? Some specific minimize some specific loss function. Okay. Any other questions? 
so just let's let me visualize back propagation in time so uh, what we have here is essentially running these sums is done by back propagation exactly the same back propagation that we had before but remember that previously every layer had a, had a separate set of parameters now all the layers have the same parameter therefore we are going to accumulate we are going to sum the contributions of different layers and we also have contributions of the loss functions for every time step so let's say we have this time step i'm going to compute the gradient there will be a gradient because of of the g the gradient because of of f and the gradient basically going back here then basically there will be a gradient because of f here and of f here and of f here and of f here and the initial state so all these gradients are going to be summed up i'm done with the contribution of lt then i'm going to go to the contribution of lt minus 1 okay and i'm going to compute again the gradient due to g and then the gradient due to f and so on okay so it's exactly the regular back propagation i'm just summing the results summing the d thetas okay now of course at least theoretically this sequence is infinite right so running running this back and forth on very long sequences is very time demanding so what is done in practice is i'm computing the loss on a small temporal window some fixed temporal window and my gradients are also limited to this uh, to this window and this is called truncated back propagation through time so here is this window i'm going to do forward pass a forward pass and a backward pass on this window only and then i'm going to move it forward in time and this is how i'm going to reduce significantly the computation complexity i'm not going to extend the length of this window from the beginning of the sequence which might be i don't know tens or tens of thousands or millions of time samples uh, uh, back in the past okay so i'm going to work with windows of the same of the same length so we'll we'll continue this discussion next week we'll see about what, about this phenomenon of uh, uh, vanishing and exploding gradients. We'll see uh, the gating mechanisms that are uh, devised to uh, to combat it, and then we'll see a mechanism that is similar to gating that is called attention, which is a very powerful idea that probably uh, mimics some some human uh, traits as well. Uh, so basically, we'll see it within the same context, and then we'll start talking about uh, generative models. Okay, see you next week. Okay, so just that, that we start, uh, I would like to talk about two topics today. I would like to finish what we started last week. We started talking, I, I remind you about uh, recurrent neural networks. So I, I would like to finish that topic and then we'll start talking about unsupervised learning and generative models. Okay, so I remind you that last time we talked about uh, the basic model for a recurrent neural network. We introduced recursion uh, for the sake of persistent persistence of the neural network state, the, its ability to capture some long long term context, and then we described basically how to adapt back propagation uh, to handle this this kind of uh, re recursive uh, dynamical system. So essentially, we had uh, we th we thought of a recurrent neural network as a feed forward <laughs> neural network, and we unfolded it in time. Okay, and that gave rise to what we call truncated back propagation in time, or at least back propagation in time that we uh, we eventually truncated in order to um, to be more computationally efficient. Okay, so today I would like to uh, mention one very significant phenomenon that actually uh, makes quite hard to train recurrent neural networks. So let's go back to our uh, very simplistic setting of uh, of an RNN. So I remind you that we have an input X, this is our input. We have a state, this is our state. So the, ne the network at a given point uh, in time T, it receives the previous state. Okay, so it, uh, it, it, it does an affine transformation to, this, to the state and the input and produces a variable which I will be calling Z. Okay, so it's just an affine transformation of the of the previous state in the input. Then it applies a, a nonlinearity to this z, and this is going to be the next state. Okay, so you see it's ht. This is the next state. 
And then from this next state, we just do a linear transformation and we produce the output. Of course, this can be more complex than, than these ba basic settings, but actually you need really a good reason to, uh, to do something more complicated than this. Okay, so this, surprisingly, this works very well. And I showed you some, uh, in my opinion, extraordinary examples that, for example, a neural network can uh, generate character by character something that looks like Shakespeare's play or, uh, or LaTeX code or, uh, or HTML or C++ code. Quite, quite remarkable, I would say. And we saw last time also that this is how we compute the gradient. Okay? And I would like to concentrate on this term. Okay, so we, we explain this term, the, the, the Jacobian of HT uh, uh, over HI, the, this is basically how the error propagates uh, back in time. Okay, so let's concentrate on this term. Again, we have uh, this expression for the, uh, uh, for the RNN, for the state update and the output. Actually, I don't really care about the output, I more care about the state update, okay? So the Jacobian of the output vector with respect to uh, to the current state vector is simply given by this matrix WHY transpose, right? When we take gradients, we, we transpose the, the matrices. Okay, so it's quite straightforward. We already did uh, the, these kind of calculations uh, many times. And this is the uh, gradient, this is the Jacobian uh, of the, of the uh, current state HT with respect to the previous state HT1 ht minus 1, right? So this is the, the current state. It depends on z, which depends linearly on ht minus 1, and, and uh, ht depends on z through this element-wise nonlinearity phi. Okay? So we'll have, obviously, whh, which, which is the linear dependence uh, of zt on ht uh, t minus 1, transposed, right? Because we're taking, taking the gradient. And then we have this diagonal matrix with phi primes, with the derivatives of phi, scaling everything from the right. Okay, so just simple rules of, uh, of uh, matrix and vector differentiation. Okay, quite, quite straightforward. And then we had this term. Now this term is the Jacobian of, it's, we call it the, 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 the immediate or instantaneous derivative. It's the uh, derivative of Hi with respect to this matrix uh, WH, uh, WHH, assuming that uh, H minus, HT minus 1 is constant. Of course, HT minus 1 also depends on WHH, right? Because it is also transformed by WHH. But we assume, we, by putting this plus sign, we imply that uh, we assume this input to be constant, independent of, of this parameter WHH. Okay, and basically we did, we did this math. This, this was one of the terms in the, in the derivative. And, and there was another term that didn't assume HT minus one uh, constant with respect to this, to this parameter. Okay, now uh, pay attention that this is, uh, this is a tensor of rank three because it's the derivative of a vector with respect to a matrix, right? So it has three dimensions. So I'm going to, I'm going to calculate its product with this vector, okay? So I'm actually summing over the dimensions of h, of the vector h. In our notation, it had k dimensions, okay? And again, we did these calculations already when we talked about backpropagation. I'm not going to repeat them again. So what we have here is this uh, delta h i, which is the derivative of the loss with respect to h i, uh, now becomes the angular matrix scaling everything from the left. And then we have uh, the matrix, the, the diagonal matrix of phi primes, and here we have an outer product of one and h i mi uh, uh, i minus one transpose. So basically, this is this is what is written here is just a matrix with with its rows h minus one transpose. Okay, like this. So let's let's combine. Uh, these terms together. This this was one of the temporal contributions that we had in our expression, right? When we computed the gradient. So let's write it like this. Again, uh, remember that this is this is our uh, expression from the, from the previous slide, right? Basically, this is our expression, and uh, delta h delta h i is this expression, right? So you have basically the the product of uh, of the current state 
with respect to the, the derivatives of the current state with respect to the previous state. Okay, and we have basically, if, if we want to go in time backwards from t to i, we have basically many, many such products, depending how far we would like to go back in time. Okay, so let me write them this way. Remember, we already derived this expression, so if I go backwards to the previous, previous slide, this was our expression for the derivative of, of the current state with respect to the previous state. Okay, so it's, it contains WHA tr transpose times phi prime. This diagonal matrix phi prime. Okay, so basically what we are going to have eventually is, uh, is a long product of WHA tr transpose phi prime. And of course phi prime is evaluated at different points. At ZT, ZT minus 1, ZT minus 2, until ZI plus 1. Okay, so just a big product of these matrices times what is written here. Okay? So this is going to be our, uh, one, of, one of the contributions to our gradient. Okay? And if uh, we remember, we, we distinguish between short-term contributions and long-term contributions. So the difference between short-term and long-term is the length of this product. How many times we multiply by this matrix WHH transpose and how many times we multiply by phi prime. Okay? So let's have a careful look uh, let me erase this, these, these annotations. So I will just call this matrix, this diagonal matrix of the derivatives, I will call it phi uh, with a time index, phi prime with a time index. So it's phi i plus 1 prime until phi t prime. Okay, and the matrix WHH transpose remains the same. doesn't depend on the, on the particular point because it's a linear, it's the gradient of a linear transformation. Okay, so let's have a careful look at this expression. I particularly care about what I highlighted here. And let's evaluate, let's, uh, let's evaluate its norm. So I will assume uh, basically any linear transformation, we have a matrix here, a linear transformation uh, can be characterized, so let's just graphically see what a linear transformation does to a vector. So a linear transformation takes a vector and then it can rotate it can rotate and scale it, right? So basically, let, let, me, let me write something like this. So I'm applying a linear transformation. As a result, I'm getting something like this. So there are two effects here. I first rotated my vector, and then I scaled its length. This is the, the, this is the only kind of trans transformations the, the, a, a linear transformation can do to a vector. And I can actually draw this graphically by drawing an ellipsoid to represent a linear transformation. There will be some directions in which the transformed vector will not rotate. It will only scale. Those directions are called the eigen, uh, eigenvectors of the matrix. Any linear transformation can be described by matrix in, in some basis. So basically, these are the eigen, eigenvectors of, of the matrix. Okay? And these are geometric quantities. Of course, they, they are covariant with the change of the basis, but they represent exactly the same quantity uh, all the time. And the amount of scale is the corresponding eigenvalue. Right? So there will be some directions, some eigenvectors corresponding to the largest eigenvalues, where the, where the scaling of the vector is the largest. And of course, the, the smallest, the smallest uh, eigenvalues correspond to the directions in which, uh, uh, in which the scaling is the smallest. And I can define a quantity which is called the spectral radius of a matrix of a, or a, of a linear transformation, telling me, I will define it by rho, uh, let's say this transformation is A, so rho A is the largest eigenvalue of a matrix. Okay? And if, if the matrix is not square, I can talk about singular values instead of eigenvalues, or the eigen, eigenvalues of uh, A transpose A. Okay, so I, this, uh, this is called the spectral radius of a matrix, and it tells me by how much, the, in the worst case, the matrix can scale the length of a vector. Okay, this is a very important algebraic quantity. So let's assume that the spectral radius of our matrix WHH, which is a square matrix, is rho. Okay, now we have another matrix here, also a k by k matrix. Phi prime. Let's assume that we have a function that has a bounded derivative. For example, if we have this uh, uh, sigmoid like function or a hyperbolic tangent, basically this is the largest slope that we have. Let's denote it by gamma. Okay, so the, the upper bound on this slope is gamma. Okay, so this means that this is a diagonal matrix with 
the values of this derivative on the diagonal. Uh, of course, the spectral radius of uh, of a diagonal matrix is just the maximum uh, maximum value on the diagonal. So the spectral radius is obviously bounded by gamma as well. Okay. Now the product of these matrices obviously will we can bound its uh, spectral radius. So let's just take a norm here and bound it. We have basically t minus i such products. We can bound the spectral radius of this w, we can bound the spectral radius of this phi prime, and we can bound it by the product of rho with gamma, right? Because this product appears t minus i times, it is rho gamma to the power t minus i, and then times the norm of what remains here denoted in gray. Okay? So basically I can say that, for, and this is true obviously for every vector denoted here in gray for every value of delta y t, if you will. Okay, and also this matrix why. So it means that if we happen to select the spectral radius of this matrix smaller than one over gamma, this entire quantity written here will be smaller than one, then raised to some power, it will vanish, right? This constant will vanish geometrically very fast. It will, it will decrease and become zero, meaning that the contributions, the long-term contributions that we defined, something that goes far enough, far, far enough backwards in time, will be simply irrelevant, right? The gradients will, will be zero. So we, we would really like to have some long-term contributions, but numerically their gradients are zero, so we don't really learn anything with gradients equals to zero, right? So then this, this phenomenon, this is a very unnice phenomenon that is called uh, vanishing gradients. Okay, so basically we, we do want to enjoy this capability of the neural network, of the recurrent neural network to, uh, uh, to be sensitive to long-term context. We somehow want to update its parameters so it captures long-term dependencies, but numerically these long-term dependencies vanish uh, uh, when we compute the gradients. Okay, and there is a, the contrary phenomenon as well. But by the way, this is a sufficient condition. So it is sufficient for uh, for this condition to, to, uh, to be satisfied in order to guarantee uh, vanishing gradients. Of course, it is not necessary. G uh, gradients might happen even if this, uh, might vanish if this condition uh, happens to be false, but it is sufficient for this condition to be satisfied in order to have vanishing gradients. Okay? Now, we can reverse this, uh, this statement and we can say that if the spectral radius of this matrix WHH transpose, or WHH doesn't matter. If it is uh, bigger than one over gamma, there might be some directions, there might be some directions, basically depending on the choice of this vector and this matrix, uh, in which the eigenvector, in, in which basically, uh, let's say the direction of, the, of an eigenvector with an eigenvalue bigger than one overall, uh, in, in those directions, the length of the gradient might be amplified. It will be amplified exponentially, right? Because basically this quantity in that direction will be very big uh, when, we, when, it, when we raise it to some, to some big power. And this phenomenon is called exploding gradients. So instead of vanishing, the gradient magnitude will be amplified uh, exponentially as we go backwards in time. So this is a necessary condition, right? It is insufficient, but this condition is necessary. And then if we are unlucky enough and we have, and our gradient coincides with that unlucky direction wh where we have uh, uh, magnification bigger than one, then we are going to have exploding gradients. Okay, any questions? So th this means, this practically means that it is very difficult, at least numerically very difficult to, do any optimization that meaningfully takes into account this long-term context that we were so keen about, and this was one of the reasons why we designed RNNs. Okay, so let's see some numerical tricks. So there are some numerical tricks that still can be uh, can be employed to, in order to uh, mitigate this phenomenon. So one 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 fundamental thing. So if we start with just random initialization, we might happen with matrices that. Uh, satisfy those uh, unlucky conditions, and then we we are we are stuck because basically the gradients will be either vanishing or exploding, and it will be very difficult to run any optimization. So one of the precautions that we can take, let's say we 
somehow initialize this matrix WHH, we are going to normalize it. So I'm going to normalize it by, I'm going to divide it by its spectral radius, I will divide, by, divide it by gamma, and then I will multiply it by some C, some constant, which is approximately 1. Okay, so this will guarantee that uh, I will have very uh, I will have very mild exploding gradients, so only maybe some directions will have very mild explosion, and there will be no vanishing gradients. Okay, so this is this is one of the possible initializations. Yes, gamma is the is the upper bound and the derivative of phi. If it's ReLU, it's just one. Okay, the the biggest the 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 steepest slope of phi. Okay, another trick that is very frequently employed in, in uh, training RNNs is what is called uh, gradient clumping. So we might have very big gradients, at this is at least to mitigate exploding gradients, we might have a big gradient, and what we are going to do, we are going to put some threshold, which I'm denoting here by tau, and if the gradient norm, the, if the length of the gradient exceeds that threshold, we are not going to take the gradient as is, which might be very long and numerically unstable, we are just going to normalize it to the maximum length tau. So I'm basically this is this vector is a denormalized gradient and has unit length, and this tau makes it of length tau. So basically, I'm taking the gradient the same direction as g points uh, points in, but if its length exceeds tau, I'm going to clamp the length by the length tau. Okay, and this actually makes the, makes numerical schemes more stable. Another phenomenon, which again, it is not something rigorously correct, but at least this is, this is uh, uh, an empirical observation, saying that uh, usually when we have exploding gradients, second-order derivatives also tend to explode. So in the direction in which we have exploding gradient, we also have exploding curvature. Okay? And we would like to make, we would like to avoid making long steps in the direction of exploding gradients because there everything is unstable. So if we use second-order methods, like for example in exact Gauss-Newton, which gives us some notion of curvature, uh, and our estimate of, of, of the curvature is good enough, we'll see that, basically, we'll have uh, those directions normalized by the inverse Hessian, right? So if we have a, a direction in which the gradient is very big, but also the Hessian has very big curvature in that direction, the inverse Hessian will, at least most of the time, will undo that uh, explosion, because it will be exploding gradient over exploding curvature, right? So one over the other, they will uh, tend to uh, to uh, undo one the, uh, one one another. Okay, and this is this is uh, a justification for using second order methods. Actually, they work really well in this setting of RNNs because usually also the number of parameters is not so huge compared to feed forward neural networks. Okay. Another another precaution that we can uh, take is to explicitly add some regularization term to the loss function. And this regularization term, for example, just look at what is written here. So this is this is the um, so the, this what is written here is the ratio of the scaling that we introduce by making one step backwards in time. Okay, basically we care about the scaling that this Jacobian does, right? So this is the ratio that uh, propagation one step backwards in time introduces, and we would like this scale to be approximately one, and we sum over all t's. So basically we want at all time steps this scale of the error propagator backwards in time to be, to be approximately one. Uh, it is a regularization term, of course, in order to do learning to do optimization with this regularization term, we need both the gradient of the loss, which we compute in the regular way, and the gradient of this regularization term, which is the gradient of the gradients, right? And it might become computationally expensive, or uh, not might, it will become computationally expensive to, in order to evaluate these, we need to do a uh, full backpropagation step, we're approximated by truncated backpropagation in time, but then we need to compute the gradients of this thing also by backpropagation. So the standard standard approach is to just say the gradients of this are, are approximated by these uh, instantaneous derivatives, assuming that the inputs do not depend on the parameters theta. Okay, and of course this is an approximation, but it, it, makes, it makes sense and it, it works well. Of course it adds computational complexity. 
however, the 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 main mechanism for uh, for uh, mitigating the uh, phenomenon of exploding and vanishing gradients is what is called um, is what is called gating. Okay, so let's again have a look at our simple RNN. Okay, so in our simple RNN, we had an affine function of the previous state and the input that was nonlinearly transformed by this function phi, and this gave us the new state update. And then this new state update gave us the output. Okay. And this was our gradient. Th that was our source of, of of the problem because basically we had to multiply uh, these terms potentially a very big number of times. So if graphically, if I unfold this network in time, these are two consecutive iterations, let's say t and t plus one. So this is the forward pass, right? This is how the information flows through the network. And I, I particularly care about the flow of h, of the state vector. So this is how it flows, right? You see it is it gets amplified by this WHH, right? So when the gradient flows backwards, this is what the gradient encounters. It has this amplification and it has this amplification. So if this amplification is bigger than one, we have an exploding gradient. If it is smaller than one, we have vanishing gradient, right? So there is no path uh, along which we don't encounter these, let's call them gains, these uh, these uh, amplifications or attenuations of the gradient, okay? So this makes the training very challenging. And yes, the question? Well, so, so exactly. So if we want, so we, we saw uh, uh, contributions from different, uh, from different times to the entire gradient. Some contributions were from long, long ago, right? Long ago means that we care about the contribution to the loss at time t from iteration, uh, from iteration i. So, so w w the gain that will w that the gradient will ex experience will be caused by this matrix WHH and also the derivative of uh, phi prime, which we currently we are ignoring in this in this drawing. It's exactly the same parameter WHH for all the layers because these are not really layers; these are just iterations and folded in time. Does it make sense to instead of multiplying it by WHH, which is the same, to just multiply by some diagonal matrix with the counter of how many WHH? It so along the way, then it might not be so explosive. So, so, so I will show you a way of uh, avoiding this this explosion by just creating a path where the gradient flows unamplified backwards in time. So, 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 the, so if you uh, if you multiply the gradient by some matrix. It has to it has to be derived from the derivative of of the forward pass, right? So you need to have some counterpart of that matrix in the forward pass. So so basically, what you are trying to control, you are trying to control the 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 eigenvalues of these uh, of of this matrix of this uh, of this parameter WHH, and you might put a regularization that. Uh, makes these eigenvalues close to one. This was exactly the regularization term that I that I showed, right? So it doesn't impose eigenvalues equal one, but the, it imposes eigenvalues equal uh, equal one at least in that direction where, uh, that you care about. So 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 again, you don't want to uh, the, the, these matrix to be unitary, right? You want to attenuate some influence and you want to amplify some influence. You just want it to be numerically stable and this is not numerically stable. Okay? So you, so you do want to forget some past or you do want to to not to forget some past depending on, on so this is exactly the learning process that has to figure out those weights that are specific for your types of input and your, your problem, problem at hand. Uh, you need to figure out these matrices but numerically doing this multiplication is very unstable okay so b basically what the the recipe that actually it has been introduced in the form a more popular form of uh, of this idea that is called lstm long uh, short time memory network uh, which is which is a mess which is a mess it has uh, many more parameters but the idea is the same so i will show you uh, the idea in a cleaner setting and actually it works more or less the same with the same performance as LSTM. It, it is just simpler. 
uh, usually it is called the uh, the gated uh, recurrent unit or GRU. Okay, so I'm going to introduce new signals. I will call them ZT and RT. So these signals uh, have the same dimension as H, and they are obtained by taking a, an affine transformation of the previous state and the and the input, and then passing them through a sigmoid. So this sigma is just a sigmoid function that saturates at zero and one. Okay. So basically, you can think of them as probability, as a result. Okay, they they are between zero and one. Uh, and then I'm going to create a candidate state update. So the candidate state update looks exactly like our regular state update, except the fact that we compute this linear transformation of the previous state by the matrix WHH that was causing our problems, right? And we we do element-wise product this. Dot the circle dot means element wise product Hadamard product if you if you if you want to be fancy uh, uh, so this element wise product is simply a mask it's a soft mask it amplifies it basically multiplies the entries of this vector by the values of R T so these are vectors of the same dimension essentially you you can think of this as a diagonal matrix with the elements of R T scaling uh, the vector that I highlighted here in red okay so you can uh, so and this, and then you of course do the nonlinear transformation with phi, and this gives you the candidate state update. And then the real state that we are going to spit out, HT, the next state that the network produces, will be again masked by this update gate. So I'm going to take Z times ZT times the previous state plus one minus ZT, uh, the new state that I, I produced. Okay. So you can you can so you see this is a convex combination of of the two vectors, right? So you can think of this as some kind of soft a soft version of an if then statement. So if our z were uh, just a binary value, we would say that if z is zero, then you take uh, the new va new value. If z is one, you forget about the new value and you take the previous value. You just keep it, right? And this is some kind of a fuzzy version of this if and then statement and the advantage of being fuzzy is that you can differentiate okay so it's a differentiable version of an if then statement okay so again we have two gates uh, these signals are called gates uh, we have one gate which is called the re reset gate and denoted by r this one uh, allows us to turn on and off and by turning on and off i mean a continuous on and off uh, uh, basically, a fuzzy on and off switch that uh, that gates the influence of the of the previous input on the putative on the candidate update of the state vector that we are computing, and then we have the update gate, which tells us in which proportion to take the previous state vector and the new one that we computed. Okay, so again, think of this as uh, as a fuzzy version of if then statements. And then the output, of course, is computed the regular way. Okay, so it looks more complicated than what we uh, what we used to have before. Okay, so we have uh, how many more parameters? So we have this parameter, we have this parameter, this one, and also these parameters, right? And we have two more uh, two more computations to uh, to perform at every iteration. Now let's let's take the gradient of this and see what it gives us in terms of uh, the vanishing gradients and uh, exploding gradients phenomenon. Okay, so I'm just applying the chain rule. We, what we have here, I'm just I'm just interested about this Jacobian, right? This matrix, this uh, this derivative of, uh, of HT with respect to HT minus one, the state with respect to the previous state. Before we just had a matrix, and that matrix was chained was multiplied multiple times when we went backwards in time and that was the source of our numerical instability now if i apply the chain rule first of all i'm going to have this matrix zt right because this is what multi multiplies ht minus one so this term contributes this this zt here it's a diagonal matrix with the values of zt on the diagonal then i'm going to have our regular expression here, which is due to QT, right? Except that it is multiplied by one mi minus ZT, this one minus ZT will be 
uh, popping up here is this diagonal matrix with one uh, minus zt on the diagonal. And then I have, uh, and then I have this term as well, right? So basically, this is the contribution of this is the derivative of zt itself, right? So zt multiplies ht minus one, and it multiplies uh, it multiplies with a minus sign qt. So we have ht minus one one minus qt. Okay, so these are the terms that are impacted by zt itself. Okay, so still slightly more complicated than 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 the derivative we had before, but nothing uh, nothing superhuman here, right? Very simple chain rule. Now I would like you to pay attention to this term. Okay, let me show it to you graphically. So graphically, this is how I decided to represent this single. Uh, iteration of of this updated neural network. This is our input. We are computing the two gates R T and Z T, and basically I, I'm drawing this as a valve, right? Like some continuous valve, which al which allows me to switch on and off the influence of the of the sorry, it should be the valve should be here, it should be on this line, right? The influence of the previous state vector. So, sorry, it's not on the green line, it's on the it's on the blue line. Fix it. So this is basically my candidate update state, and then I have this continuous switch, which is controlled by the by the uh, by the update gate ZT, that allows me to to take some contribution of the previous st state vector unaltered, and the new state vector, basically with some some blend of these two. Okay, and of course it produces the output. So if I now propagate the gradient backwards, and this gate is open, meaning that zt is 1, or closed, doesn't matter how we refer to this state, you see the gradient flows backwards unimpeded. If the gate is closed, then we have we need to pass through this block, and this block gives us the attenuation or the amplification that was so, uh, uh, so harmful to the computation of the gradient. But if the gate here is in this state, there is no amplification, it's just passing through backwards through this, through this unit. And if we, if we want to really learn some long-term context, we need to close these, these gates for, for those inputs uh, or for those states that we care about. And the gradients can propagate backwards for thousands of iterations without uh, suffering significant attenuation or amplification. Okay, and this, this idea Seems to be very powerful. You will you will see some examples in in the in the tutorial and also in the exercise. Basically, it really works. It changes completely the numerical tractability of these uh, of these models by just adding these these two uh, these two gate signals. Uh, the first the first uh, uh, embodiment of this idea was again, as I said, in the form of an LSTM network that is more complex than than, the, than what is shown here. It is usually something that is uh, you, that is done in practice. However, this simple architecture is, I claim, it is as efficient as the original LSTM architecture. Okay. Now we can employ exactly the same mechanism for another purpose. So basically, you see, we have. Uh, in our vanilla network, as well as in our uh, uh, gated version of the network, we had basically this linear transformation of the input vector, right? And this linear transformation of the input vector, we actually took the input vector in, in its entirety. Now imagine we have some very complex input space, and it might be very hard by just doing this simple linear transformation to do something useful with this input vector. It might be too too complicated. Either we put some more complex transformation here, which is not so desired because the entire architecture will be more complicated, or we can we can gate it in a in a way very similar to what we did with gating in time. So basically, let's compute some gate signal GT here, and we'll mask the input vector by this gate. Okay, and this gate. Again, we can think of it as some differentiable, some fuzzy, fuzzy way of doing masking. So this is a soft mask that is applied to the input vector. Okay, and we are going to uh, compute this 
gate signal, for example, one of the standard ways of doing it is by taking a softmax of, uh, of another signal that is computed again as this sigmoid of uh, an affine transformation of the previous state and the current input. And this gate is called the attention vector. Okay, so basically we are trying to concentrate on some region in the input vector that the network deems relevant at this point in time. Okay, so basically the network itself updates this vector here. And you can find some similarity to how our attention, our human attention works. For example, if you record the, the, the movement of the eyes when a person looks at this, at this picture, Actually, you will see that we don't really see the whole picture. The vision is, is an active process. So the eye will scan the picture, concentrating attention on some salient features that probably are relevant to recognizing this face, for example. And basically, this attention mechanism that I described to you, which is exactly as doing gating, but gating was done in time, and this one is done on the input vector, basically tries to mimic this, this mechanism. Yes. So, 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 so obviously, the, the the idea of attention can be combined with uh, different diverse architectures, not necessarily RNNs. Actually, it can be combined with gating. So here, it was just a vanilla RNN for simplicity, but I can have a gated RNN with an attention mechanism. I, it is quite appealing to use attention in the context of RNNs because then then it will be quite close to this analogy. So you can think of uh, processing the same input by uh, ev by in steps, in time steps, every time, looking uh, looking at the input with a different attention mask. So in this sense, I'm going to to take a portion of the of the input, look at it, decide where to move my attention, and then produce a new attention, uh, uh, digest this new input with, with, with masked by a new attention mask, and update my state accordingly. So, so it's 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 an it's a sequential process. It makes sense to make it sequential. So, so, so the question was uh, whether, for example, attention, different mechanisms of attention uh, with maybe different attention, different layers have been used in, in CNN. So the answer is yes, probably uh, the idea of attention is one of the, one of the most interesting ideas that uh, were proposed in, in deep learning in the last five or 10 years. So th this, is an, uh, is, this is an area of very active research. There are hundreds of papers that are dedicated to, to, uh, to different ways of integrating attention mechanisms in not only in CNNs, in, in very different uh, architectures and very different settings. So I don't think the last word has been said. So uh, this is just a very basic idea. Of course, it was uh, initially proposed in this uh, uh, temporal context, in the context of RNNs, but it can be, as I said, uh, it can be employed in different ways as well. Okay? So, well, I, I, I told you already that I'm not a big fan of RNNs, though they, they, they can do really cool, uh, cool things. I would like to propose you an alternative to RNNs, and uh, recently there has been a growing amount of evidence that uh, feed-forward architectures with one uh, particular feature that is called dilated convolution can actually perform on many, many tasks as well as uh, uh, recurrent networks, and one of the, I think, one of the good examples would be, for example, not so recent, probably two years ago, uh, a work by uh, by DeepMind that produced uh, extremely, uh, I would say, unbelievably a high quality speech synthesis using these kind of these kind of ideas. And the, the idea is called dilated convolution. So just as a reminder, what we had in in the convolutional layer, we had some input sequence x. I'm, I'm thinking of it some, as some d-dimensional signal. can be infinitely supported, of course. In practice, it, the support is not infinite. So this index starts at some smallest values and ends at some biggest values. But this can be a, a d-dimensional multi-index, for example, a two-dimensional index in the case of images. And I have, again, some sequence of weights, which I can also interpret as a d-dimensional signal. Of course, typically weights are finitely supported and have a very small support, let's say a three by three filter. And this is my convolution, right? So uh, it's just this sum over ZD of WK and minus K. And we interpreted this as a shift invariant or better say translation equivariant 
linear operation. Okay, this is convolution. Now I'm going to replace this convolution with what is called what is called dilated convolution. So I'm going to put this number p next to the convolution operation to indicate that this, it is dilated. And dilation simply means that I'm not going to subtract k, the index of the sum, but I'm going to subtract it in strides of p. And in, in this case, p in every direction. Of course, I can, I can be smart and do different dilation in different directions, but usually it is the same factor in every direction. Okay, so let me write it in a different way. I would like to introduce this operation, which is called expansion or dilation. So by, by dilation, I mean that I take, I take a signal in a certain grid, okay? This is my signal, and it has some samples. Okay, let's call this sample, for example, star. This will be a triangle, this will be a circle, this will be, let's say, a square, okay? And then I'm going to transfer it on a different grid, let's say twice denser. So I'm going to put a star here, then I'm going to put a zero here, then I'm going to put a triangle, then I'm going to put a zero, then I'm going to put a circle, then a zero, then a rectangle, then a zero. Okay? So basically this is called an expanded or a dilated sequence. So I'm thinking of it now sampled on a twice denser grid, and I retain the values of the original samples only where that grid coincides with my original grid, and I'm filling the rest with zeros. Okay? So this is what this operation does. Okay, so in these terms now, I can think of the of dilated convolution as simply convolution with a dilated kernel. So my filter is now dilated. Instead of being, let's say, something like this, this is my filter. Now my filter becomes wider by factor p, and it looks like this. And I'm doing co convolution with this filter. And just look at this expression and convince yourselves that what is written in this li in this line what is written in this line is exactly the same okay so this is this is dilated convolution now this is just a visualization okay hopefully you like my art actually i drew it by by by, by hand uh, so what what you see here are three layers three convolution layers i'm of course ignoring all the uh, all the um, nonlinear operations so this is this is just a one-dimensional example. Let's say this is my uh, my grid. And this is dilation factor p equals 1, which means that this is just regular convolution. Suppose my filter looks like just two samples. Okay, so I'm, let's say, of the same height, one half and one half. So I'm doing averaging. So basically, the, the first sample of the output will be the average of these two input samples. The second sample of my output will be the average of these two. Uh, samples of the input. Now I'm doing a dilated convolution with the factor p equals 4. So this output sample is going to be based by the sum of this sample and then I skip 1, 2, 3 and this sample. Okay, so you see the dilation happens here because I'm writing p times k. So it's 4 times k. So I'm going to the f next fourth sample in the input sequence, which is equivalent to saying that I'm doing regular convolution, but now my kernel has 0, 0, 0 here in the impulse response, and then another sample, non-zero sample here. Okay? And this is how dilation factor p equals 8 looks like. Same idea. Okay? Now, if you just take a regular CNN and replace regular convolutions with dilated convolutions with the dilation factor exponentially growing with depth, so let's say 2 to the power of L. L is the, the depth of the layer. So the first layer will be just regular convolution. The second layer will be doing dilated convolution with the factor p equals 2, then p equals 4, then p equals 8, then 16, and so on. Okay? So what you are going to have, the receptive field, the support, the, the, uh, the support of input samples that affect your output sample will also grow exponentially with depth. Okay? So if you think of this in terms of temporal signals, it means that your, your context in the past will be, that, in, that impacts an individual output sample can be very long, can be very long backwards into, into the past.
well, so uh, again, a regular CNN with just with just dilated convolution. So again, if you have depth one dilation one receptive field of two, depth two dilation two receptive field of four, then eight, then sixteen. So you see, it basically grows exponentially, right? And if you think of this mechanism in time, and you make sure that your filters are causal, meaning that they have only uh, basically the impulse responses of the filter exist only in the in the positive part of the of the time axis then you have something that can be can be thought of as an alternative to rnn so it will be a feed forward neural network with a very very long receptive field backwards in time it can be many many thousands of uh, of samples of course you created by adding depth to the network but it wouldn't be such a deep network for example if you if you do this trick for a network with with 10 layers, you already get uh, 1,000 samples, right? Or a few thousand samples, depending on the length of your filter. If you make, if you make 20 layers, then you get significantly longer uh, context in time. So it's, it's, it, it can be practically, uh, it c we can practically approximate very long uh, support, very long, very long support of the receptive field uh, without doing any recursion. And because we don't have recursion, we don't suffer from problems like uh, vanishing and exploding gradients, which is, which is uh, uh, a good property of CNNs. CNNs are much easier to train compared to RNNs. Of course, we have more parameters typically in these situations, but this can be, can be actually a good thing because we have more degrees of freedom. We have more capacity of this model. Well, so, so why we have more parameters? Because in, 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 uh, in RNN, we have the same parameters. So if you think of RNN as, an, as a feed-forward network unfolded in time, then it, the, the layer has the same parameters. Typically, in a CNN, we don't share parameters between the layers. Of course, it is possible, but typically, it is not, it is not uh, uh, practiced. So then we'll have more degrees of freedom. But otherwise, uh, it will be a very, uh, it will be a, a huge, uh, receptive field network obtained in this way. And actually there is growing evidence that this kind of uh, what is called time convolutional network, dilated convolution with, with causal filters, actually performs well, equally well or even better and of course easier to train uh, on the same tasks that RNNs excel on. Of course, it can be combined with attention mechanism, it can be combined with, with many uh, ideas that, uh, uh, that we have seen. Uh, but it will be a feed-forward network with all the advantages that it, that it has. Oh, so the time, so just think of a, of a one-dimensional CNN, right? So what is written here, this n, in, in the case of d equals one, d is the dimension of the signal, it will be a time sequence, right? n will be the, the time index of the sequence. So x is the input. It's x, we are doing, we are convolving the input with some kernel. Okay, and of course you can combine all the tricks that we had in CNN, like skip connections, like batch normalization, all all those tricks that are so powerful in training CNNs. Okay, any questions? Yes. Yes. Is it correct to say that uh, TCNs have more parameters than simple LSTM? So well, usually uh, the TCNs will have more parameters than than RNNs. So I, I think a comparison, uh, so if we think of linear filtering, uh, there are two ways of designing linear filters. One of them is finite impulse response filters, which are just uh, doing moving average, okay? And then we have a certain amount of taps, a certain amount of filter coefficients that we can design. And if we want very long impulse response, then we'll need to have more, many more, basically many coefficients, right? And uh, the alternative is what is called IAR, infinite impulse response filters. These are rational functions. These are solved by solving a di difference equation. And uh, uh, they are much harder to design, much harder to analyze. They can be unstable. They have infinite impulse response. And you can get very long impulse responses with just a, just a few uh, coefficients. So they might be more compact in terms of the number of degrees of freedom to represent something long term, but they are much messier to work with. Okay? For example, they have nonlinear phase, things like that, which is very, very unnice if you do signal processing. 
uh, but they can be very compact to compute. Same story about RNNs. You might do very complicated things with very with a very small model, uh, but uh, then it will be difficult to train. You will need some kind of mechanism like gating that that we mentioned. Uh, the fit forward alternative is more brute force. It's straightforward. It's much easier to train. And if you have enough data and you and you can put enough compute power to the training, then it will produce similar results, but uh, I think with less effort. So I, I would say in, in DSP, you usually prefer finite impulse response unless you have some significant latency or compute power restrictions. I would say the same should be true for these models as well. Okay.